Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is uh, Dan Hurley. I am the chair elect and a member of the board of the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance. I'm also the uh, principal for the Hurley Martin Group, a new public relation and stakeholder engagement uh, partnership based here on Gabriella Island. I want to acknowledge, first of all, that we're on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish, the Kwakiwak, and the New Chalet peoples, on whom we work and live every day. Um, we welcome you to our ninth video session hosted by Bahia. And it is uh, a great pleasure for, to have so many of you join us uh, on a regular basis. Uh, the purpose of holding these video sessions are twofold. It is to help unite and connect our decision makers, especially during this time of uncertainty and to inform and add to the conversation on the economic and social vitality of Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands region. Uh, today, we're pleased to have a representative of the federal level government as our speaker today to discuss and make sense of all of these programs and measures that the federal government is taking to support businesses, charities, and nonprofits during COVID-19 and what more can be done to help support all of you. But before we introduce our, new, our, our speaker today, a few details. Uh, we'll have a few opening remarks, followed by about 40 minutes of questions and answers. I have a number of prepared questions that I will be asking first and then we'll turn it over to you. To ask your question, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and enter your questions in there. I will moderate those questions and try to ask as many as we can during the time allotted. And today we have approximately 60 minutes uh, with our special guests. If we don't get to your question or comment, please feel free to send those questions to our president, George Hansen, at george at Bahia, B -I -E -A, dot C-A. We ask uh, everyone to please keep your uh, mutes on and your video off during the session so that we don't disrupt the flow of our presentation today. So with that said, I would like to now introduce our special speaker. Uh, Terry Beach is the Member of Parliament for Burnaby North Seymour. He also serves as Chair of the Pacific Liberal Caucus and is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. Terry is no stranger to Vancouver Island, having been born in Comox and raised in Victoria and Nanaimo, and so he knows our region quite well. He's eager to hear from you by his membership about what more the government can be doing to ensure that all of our Vancouver Island and Gulf Islands communities uh, can thrive and can be supported during these challenging times. So Terry, thanks very much for joining us today, and I'm gonna hand it over to you for a few moments to make some opening remarks. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Dan and George for putting this together. Any opportunity that I have uh, to connect with people back in Vancouver Island, I usually try to take advantage of that. Uh, specifically, a pleasure to be uh, speaking with all the members of the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance. Uh, bonjour à tous, et un grand plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui avec vous. Um, I'm not going to say too much in my opening uh, comments. Uh, I've been doing uh, quite a few of these kind of town hall style Zoom events. Uh, I think they're quite effective. Uh, there's obviously uh, a lot of changing variables. Uh, I was saying before the, uh, this session started to Dan and George uh, that in my five years as a member of parliament, I've never actually seen uh, the federal government uh, act in such a, a fast and entrepreneurial capacity. Uh, as a previous entrepreneur myself, uh, it's an environment uh, that I, uh, I, I enjoy working in. Um, and I think what's going to be most useful for today is um, I'm going to try and provide my, uh, you know, for all the questions that you have, I'm going to try and provide the current state of affairs. Um, that being said, it is incredibly fast moving. I mean, we're seeing uh, discussions happen one day and the prime minister announce something the next day. Uh, and then us receiving some feedback about how that might have missed the target or there's some organizations that fell through the cracks and then adjustments being made. Uh, the following day. So I think uh, one part of this session can be about uh, providing the most up-to-date information, uh, but another part of this session uh, can certainly be about hearing uh, your feedback, hearing your opinions on how things are going and how we can uh, further help uh, Canada and, and particularly those individuals and businesses on Vancouver Island uh, in this very uh, unprecedented time. Uh, so with that, Dan and George, I think that uh, I'll include my opening comments there. Happy to get to the questions and, and really excited to get to the discussion with everybody that's here today. Well, uh, thank you very much, Terry. Um, so yes, we're gonna start. We have a few questions we wanna get through uh, first that cover a wide spectrum of different issues. And then we'll turn it over to everyone that's here to enter your questions. So once again, to enter your questions, 
please enter them into the chat function in your Zoom. If you're on a desktop, it should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, so first of all, Terry, um, a, a major concern that we're hearing from small businesses uh, has to do with, aside from obviously trying to maintain payroll and uh, to be able to maintain operations, is the whole issue of lease payments um, during a period of zero revenue. Can you explain any details that you're able to provide at this time uh, with the new Canada BC Commercial Rent Assistance uh, Initiative? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, this is this is something that I've been hearing about a lot as well. Even though our member of parliament offices are closed, uh, we're, we're actually operating seven days a week. Um, so, but it's all virtual like this or phone calls. And um, as a previous entrepreneur, I do tend to hear uh, significantly more from the business community. Um, we announced uh, just in the last few days, the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program for small businesses. Um, not all the details of that are available. So if you're looking to get all those details today, I'm just gonna say right up front that I don't have them all. Uh, the reason for the announcement, of course, was to signal uh, that it is our, inter uh, our intention to help in this particular area. Um, so while I don't have specific details, I can say generally, uh, the idea is to provide uh, loans, including some forgivable, forgivable loans that would go to uh, landlords uh, who in turn would forego rent for small businesses from their tenants. Uh, the idea would be to have this be retroactive for the month of April and then apply to May and June. So right now we're thinking uh, in a three month time period. Uh, this is something specifically because the tenant landlord relationship is governed by the provincial government. We have to work with the province on this, uh, but we do know that it's a, an urgent issue and that people are very concerned about it. And people are making, small business owners are making those decisions about, you know, very serious decisions, about am I gonna be able to make through this? Uh, do I need to wrap up? What other adjustments do I need to make uh, around hiring, et cetera? Um, so we've set a working deadline of, of having details before the end of the month. And that's what we're currently working with. Okay, well, that's very helpful. We look forward to that. That's a, a major issue for a lot of, a lot of businesses, um, but it's uh, very helpful to know that that, that uh, information will be, will be forthcoming shortly. Uh, so the next question has to do with the temporary wage subsidy program. Uh, I know that's been a, a, a topic of a lot of conversation for businesses, and that's about to get rolled out. Uh, so many small businesses and nonprofit organizations operate without the standard payrolls because they engage contractors rather than hiring employees. Yeah. Is the government giving consideration to adjusting the qualifying terms of this subsidy program to assist, assist such enterprises? So I, I guess I'd start by saying that um, when it comes to the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy Program, or Qs as we've shortened it, um, we have been making adjustments pretty regularly. Um, I mean, it started a 10% subsidy uh, which was basically just not us, just us not taking the money that we were going to give back in the first place. Um, but very quickly realized that uh, the model that they were utilizing, I think the first time this was utilized in Denmark, was much, much more effective at the 75% rate. Uh, we've made some recent adjustments, uh, including uh, only needing a 15% reduction in revenue in March, and, uh, and then of course the 30% in April and May, but also some changes around how that is measured. And I think we can get into that uh, going forward. When it comes to the contractor issue, uh, this is also something that I've, that I've heard about. Um, it is an issue that the federal government is aware of, has acknowledged and is working on. Uh, but at this time, all I can say is that we're working on it. I don't have any announcements to make uh, today. Okay. Uh, well, that one will, will continue to come up. So uh, it'd be helpful to know if there's a, a, a some progress in terms of being able to address that because that is an area that uh, I know a number of people feel like uh, there's a gap. So appreciate yeah. you mentioning that. Um, so related to that, many charitable organizations with seasonal fundraising schedules will not know the actual impact of COVID-19 on their annual revenues until later this calendar year. And while they do not presently qualify for the temporary wage subsidy, they are already able to project a significant drop in annual revenues, but won't be able to show these numbers until the fourth quarter. What advice do you have for these organizations? Uh, okay, so a number of things, uh, including, I think this applies to the last question and probably all the questions you're gonna ask today. Um, for those situations that are highly specific uh, and may uh, have you being uh, one of the exceptional businesses or, or nonprofits that are falling through the cracks, 
uh, definitely encourage you to reach out to your members of parliament uh, or, or myself or, or any member that, you're, that, you, that you know, um, because we are literally building case studies of these, these situations and sending them straight to Ottawa and they are adjusting incredibly quickly. Um, when it comes to measuring your baseline revenue, uh, there has been some renewed flexibility on how you can go about measuring that. Uh, so the kind of first way of doing that is to compare your current revenue against what you were making in a similar month in 2019. Uh, the second way is to take the average of what you made in January and February and compare that against your current month. Um, if you're operating a nonprofit or a charity, you have the added flexibility of being able to choose to either add or deduct uh, any revenue that you receive from the government. Uh, the only thing to understand about that is if that makes your finances works and, and makes you qualify for the program, just know that once you use that standard of measurement, you'll have to use that same standard of measurement uh, throughout the entire period of the program. Um, I am aware of, you know, organizations, for example, that have big fundraising galas in the, in the fall and are very nervous because they already know that even if they're able to have people and groups in, in rooms, uh, certainly the economy is going to stretch that fundraising already as well. And if that was their one big gala of the year where they get maybe 50% of their funding, uh, that's a big issue. Um, there are, uh, so, so if you're one of those groups, I'd say first thing of action is reach out to your members of parliament because that allows us to build these case studies to help augment the programs. Uh, there are also additional programs. Uh, you know, the Canada Emergency Bank Account. Uh, if you have a payroll, and we've actually just recently adjusted this, anywhere between 20,000 and 1.5 million in 2019, uh, there you would probably qualify for this account. It allows for up to a $40,000 loan. Uh, what's important to know about that is that it, this loan is interest-free. Uh, and if you pay it back before December of 2022, so within the first couple of years, uh, up to 25% of that loan is also forgivable. So if you borrow 40, you don't have to pay 30 back, which basically acts like a $10,000 uh, subsidy. Um, there are some newly announced programs specifically to nonprofits and charitable organizations around specific sectors, a culture, heritage, sports organizations, uh, organizations that help vulnerable communities. And these are new programs that are in the hundreds of millions. So if you don't necessarily qualify for this program now and you don't have a workaround, uh, certainly express that concern if your situation is specific as what Dan just uh, described in the question. Uh, but look to these other programs as well because they might have more flexibility to accommodate your specific situation uh, faster than waiting for the program to again be adjusted. All right, well, thank you. Uh, so this is sort of related. Many community organizations earn a significant amount of their annual operating revenues from special events and conferences. So you've, we've already talked about fundraising organizations, but it's also uh, a whole bunch of organizations that plan annual conferences, VAIA being an example of that with our summit in October. With all such events canceled or significantly altered and reduced, many of these organizations will struggle to survive with drastically reduced revenues, but will not be able to demonstrate this loss until well after April and June, the April yeah. to June period. So what advice do you have for these organizations in, in addition to what you've suggested? Well, if, if you're not expecting that loss until the fall, for example, uh, hopefully you have, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of operating, I wouldn't say ordinarily, but hopefully you have the revenue you're expecting to have at present. Um, but you should still plan to prepare now. Um, so, you know, we've planned the majority of our programs in the short term uh, up until June. That's not to say that there won't be more programs or extensions of the program beyond June, but if your uh, fundraiser is in July, as an example, or your, your major event is in August or September, um, you need to do the same thing that people are doing around their weddings or around uh, you know, personal large events. Um, you know, maybe you're not making the same deposit, maybe you're me reaching out to the, the facilities in advance. Um, if your event is around some of those specific um, things I talked about in the previous question, so uh, cultural heritage sports organizations, there is a new half a billion dollar fund specifically geared towards you. 
Um, and th that $500 million, while well, it works in similar ways to Q's, uh, it does have more flexibility. So you should reach out uh, about those programs. You can reach out directly to the uh, appropriate ministry. Um, and you can do that through your MP. Um, there is the new emergency community support fund as well. That's an additional $350 million program. So if you're a nonprofit, for example, uh, who provides support to vulnerable community, uh, vulnerable citizens within the community, that might be another source of funding that you could certainly uh, access. Um, also, I would suggest, even if you're not in financial straits now, maybe consider looking at the Canadian emergency bank account now um, because if you can utilize some of those funds, um, you know, it's a smaller sum of money, but perhaps some of that granting money uh, would be useful, even if you don't actually need it until your event uh, post June. Um, so I guess in the short term, those are kind of the coping things that I can, that I can think about. Uh, but certainly uh, when we get into the questions, if you have specific situations that I'm not thinking about, I, that's what I'm here to hear about. Uh, so, and I will be taking anything I hear today that I haven't either thought of or, or heard from uh, my community or people that call my office, and I will be taking those immediately back to Ottawa. So, for everybody that's listening to this, it's going out like, yeah, but that doesn't quite address my specific situation. Yeah. Uh, I want to hear about it. Well, don't worry. There's lots of questions coming in. So, sure. uh, and they are already, uh, there'll lot, be lots of questions to answer at this point. Um, I'll do so my best. i do my best. <laughs> All right. Um, the next question has to do with uh, self-employed individuals, something I've been hearing a lot about, uh, myself included, but uh, lots of, as you know, the island so well, um, there are lots of uh, uh, solopreneurs out there. There are lots of uh, mom and pop family businesses that are really struggling right now. And typically they would not uh, qualify for employment insurance and uh, your government's made some changes to that. So can you describe, can you kind of uh, maybe detail what, what uh, these individuals need to do to help qualify and apply for the benefits program for self-employed. Yeah, so if you qualify for EI and, and you need financial assistance, obviously the employment insurance program is the first place you should look. If you're one of these individuals that do not uh, qualify for EI because you're a contractor, you're self-employed, uh, you haven't banked the appropriate number of hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then that is exactly what the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was created for. Uh, this is a program that could provide up to $2,000 a month for up to four months. Uh, in British Columbia, I believe um, you will also be able to qualify for a one-time stipend of $1,000 from the provincial government, uh, although I don't have the details on exactly how that's rolling out. So that's up to $9,000 over the four-month period. Um, to get the most up-to-date information and to see whether or not you qualify, and actually to look at all these programs I've been discussing today, your best number one one-stop resource is canada.ca slash COVID-19. So as quickly as I produce my reports and things and send out my emails and talk to constituents, uh, the, uh, the organization of the federal government that's uh, running that page is actually doing it in real time much faster than myself. So that's always a great place to look. Uh, if you need to apply for CURB, which is what we're calling it, this is the emergency response benefit, uh, you're going to need your name, you're going to need your social insurance number. Uh, you can uh, apply directly online through the CRA or through uh, your My Account with the CRA. Uh, you can also call, uh, it's 1-800-959-2222. Uh, uh, and you can call the CRA directly. And again, they'll take your name, they'll take your, um, your SIN number. Um, and then before you do that though, it's probably a good thing to go on to uh, canada.ca slash COVID-19 and just understand the eligibility criteria. Basically anybody who applies is going to get it, but the government will be checking the eligibility criteria afterwards. So uh, the experience of my constituents so far has been if they call the line, uh, payments can be made in as quickly as three days. Um, but just know that uh, there are, you know, you're, you should have lost your employment opportunities because of COVID-19. Uh, perhaps you had to stay home because your uh, kids can't be in daycare. Um, there are, and, and, this, and the criteria for CURB has been expanding. Um, so just make sure you check that because we will be checking uh, afterwards. But basically, if you call that number, you give them your name and your sin, uh, funds should be flowing to you uh, within a matter of days. All right, thank you for that. I think there's gonna be more questions about that. We'll come to that in the next round. The two more questions that I have before we turn it over to our uh, audience. Uh, the next question has to do with students and recent graduates. 
So we know that your government uh, made a major announcement yesterday, $9 billion worth of support for students and recent grads. So they created the uh, Canada Emergency Summer Benefit and the Canada Student Services Grant. Uh, so as you know, many, many students everywhere, but particularly here on the island, rely on summer, uh, summer uh, jobs to help fund their post-secondary and many industries like tourism, uh, hospitality and so forth depend on those students uh, for that support. So can you maybe describe a little bit what the difference between those programs are? And then there's the, there's the Canada Summer Jobs Program and um, the, uh, which again, employs many of these students. So I don't know if that program is still in existence and the deadline is usually uh, earlier, it's usually in February. So is there any plans to change uh, uh, the eligibility criteria for that program? So just well, generally your approach to, to students, go ahead. So, so I am so happy that you asked this question because as uh, one of caucuses Elder millennials, uh, I, uh, and, and as a previous instructor at SFU and UBC, I constantly think about how our policies are affecting students. And, uh, and that Simon Fraser University is actually in my writing. Um, and I've been working on a post-secondary uh, student package for three weeks. So it's quite convenient that they decided to roll it out a couple of days before this call. So I can tell you all about it, um, or at least about most of the things. Again, to get all of the details, you can, you can find this stuff uh, online. Um, so yes, let's start with Canada Summer Jobs because that's the last thing that you mentioned, the, the second thing that you mentioned. The Canada Summer Jobs program is still running. It has changed slightly. Uh, we will now subsidize up to 100% of the cost of hiring a student, uh, but only up to 100% of minimum wage. So if you are uh, paying your student more than minimum wage, you will be asked to uh, make up the difference. Uh, you're right that the timing usually rolls out January, February. Um, the existing list is what it is. Uh, members of parliament have some flexibility to add new organizations if they're providing uh, uh, priority services around COVID-19 response. Um, so if you are uh, an organization that is providing those services, uh, certainly reach out to the member of parliament where you conduct that business. Uh, Canada Summer Jobs is the only program that is actually uh, largely controlled by the individual member of parliament. Uh, so definitely you're gonna to wanna to be in contact. Uh, these new uh, criteria, we expect to create 70,000 jobs for students between the ages of uh, 15 to 30. So hopefully this will provide some much needed uh, employment in an environment where you know, a lot of jobs that are normally provided to students uh, are no longer available. Um, Part of the announcement, so the announcement a couple days ago was a $9 billion package. Uh, one of the major uh, components of that is the Canada Emergency Student Benefit. Uh, that's uh, up to $1,250 a month from the, for the months of May to August. And it's $500 more if you have um, a dependent or a disability. So then you, get, you could qualify for $1,750 a month. Um, the Canada Service Corps program has been expanded. So this is like a micro loan program where young people can design their own community specific programs. And if they design a community specific program that is helping with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, they could be eligible for that funding. Uh, normally, I think there's about 1,800 uh, of these grants available. That has been expanded to 15,000. So it's a significant increase. Um, we're going to double the uh, Canada Student Loans uh, our student grants program. So this is the money that students don't have to pay back. Um, that was a part of our election platform, if I remember correctly, in the last election. So that's just us rolling that out uh, early. Um, there's going to be enhancements to the student loan program. And then another program, which I think is really interesting, I, and I'm forgetting the name of it off the top of my head, um, but there's going to be a volunteer program uh, that basically will provide up to $5,000 of tuition for a student in the fall or later on, it's gonna be a $5,000 tuition credit basically to students who decide to volunteer. So if there are organizations that uh, need students or uh, businesses that uh, need students um, where students want to volunteer uh, uh, kind of on the front lines, I think it might have a, a COVID-19 uh, emergency response criteria as well, although I have to double check that. Um, then students, could get that. So in total, if you were a student and you couldn't find employment that was satisfactory for you, 
you could collect the Canada Emergency Student Benefit for $5,000, and then you could volunteer over the summer for a $5,000 tuition credit, and overall, uh, you'd have access to $10,000 uh, towards your schooling and rent, et cetera, um, by September, by the end of the summer. So that, that is kind of high level, broad strokes, the student package. Um, but if you have uh, kids that are students, or if you're a student yourself, I, I go online and, and read through all the details because there's probably multiple things that would apply to you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a number of measures there. I just, just as a follow up to that though, in terms of thinking as an employer or, or for employers out there that are looking to hire students or we're considering hiring students, um, is there anything they can do, or could there could there be concern that with that support, maybe is there are, are there any concerns about not being able to hire students because of the financial support they may get now? Uh, well, I mean, even these programs now uh, have the flexibility so that uh, not just uh, it, it's through the CURB program, but also through the student program that people can earn income. Um, so I just by looking at the number of people that are approaching my office. I don't think that there is going to be a challenge, but certainly if those numbers come back and we're not able to fill those positions, I think there will be an argument to adjust. Um, thinking back to my student days, which was not too long ago, but getting further and further away, the more I think about it, um, you know, you're looking for that work experience. You're looking for as much income as you can get. Um, this is going to provide flexibility to those individuals that are in vulnerable situations and may not be able to work. Uh, it's going to have, it's basically going to be um, the maximum amount of flexibility so that we're thinking about students, uh, you know, who may not have to work. We have students that have to work, students that have to work but can't, students that are in uh, remote communities and can't access standard employment, other students that are in urban that have much different uh, demographics. So we've designed it to be incredibly flexible because we don't have two weeks to make this program perfect. I mean, students are coming into the workforce within the next couple of days. So I am certain that there will need to be adjustments, but uh, this is our first crack. All right, well, thank you. Uh, there's a few questions, more specific questions about that. We'll get to it in just a second. I have sure. one more prepared question, and it has to do more with uh, supporting regional economic development. And um, you know, right now we're focused on getting through the next few weeks and months. We're starting to think, we're really starting to think about what the recovery period is gonna look like. But more importantly, we're also looking at how we, we're going to shift the economy going forward and advance um, towards maybe a different way of how we, uh, how we interact as businesses and, and communities. So I'm thinking, for example, with um, Bahia's project, supporting the growth of the seaweed aquaculture industry, which is a new uh, but very regional specific industry. In or my portfolio. Exactly. There you go. Um, and so uh, it is a new industry and it's been made possible through uh, an initiative known as the Foreign Trade Zone uh, Vancouver Island, which uh, the government provided that designation a couple of years ago. So uh, that allows us to be more uh, poised to take advantage, a competitive advantage for the island economy. So, and for things like programs like Island Good, which has seen some real success over the last few years uh, with licensing and our partnerships with food producers, uh, grocery uh, organizations and, and other partners. So just overall, what funding do you think will be dedicated to support regional in initiatives for advancing the economy going forward? That is a great question. Um, okay. Uh, well, with, with regards to the, one of the specific companies that you mentioned, Cascadia Seaweed, um, I actually got a letter from their president, uh, Mike Williamson, I think, and uh, their manager, I got an email from their manager, Aaron, uh, yesterday, actually. And so I was thinking specifically about programs that might benefit them. Uh, there is a $287 million rural development fund. Whether or not they would qualify for that, I am uncertain. There is a... Uh, a sustainable development aquaculture fund that they may be able to apply for funds from. Um, and certainly they can follow up with me personally and I'd be happy to put them in touch with people in the department about that specifically. Um, one of the things that I was very concerned about, as I mentioned at the start of this, before I was a member of parliament, excuse me for a second, <clears throat> before I was a member of parliament, I was an entrepreneur and uh, very concerned about, um, I'm just gonna take a sip of water here. I might have to refill this to get through the hour. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm very concerned about uh, high growth companies and in particular 
uh, pre-revenue companies or early revenue companies. Uh, because if you look at the criteria for Qs, uh, you know, they're not necessarily having that 30%, uh, you know, or 15% or revenue reduction that qualifies them for some of these programs. Uh, within the last 10 days, uh, I'm not sure the exact day, there was a $250 million uh, fund for high growth companies specifically that don't qualify for Qs. Um, this is going to be administered by uh, IRAP. And, uh, you know, and judging by the letter that Mike wrote me, it looks like they are po poised for high growth. So, uh, and I imagine they might even already have an IRAP advisor. So certainly reach out to your IRAP advisor. If you don't have one, reach out, find one uh, to get a hold of a tech advisor and see if you can apply for that program. That only opened up, what day is it today? Oh, is it the 23rd today? I think it opened up, on the, yeah, it's 23rd today. So I think it opened up on the 22nd. So I, th those applications literally just open. So that might be something that they can utilize. Of course, there are multiple um, tax deferral programs, both for corporate income and personal income that people should utilize. Um, uh, Export Development Canada, another organization I used to work for, uh, and uh, the Business Development uh, Corporation uh, have access to $10 billion of new capital capacity uh, to provide loans for viable uh, businesses up to, uh, up to I, I think it's just over six, I want to say $6.25 million, but I'm not sure if that's right, so don't hold me to that, but it's just over, I know it's just above $6 million maximum business loans. Um, and then I guess the other thing that I would say uh, with regards to your question, you also mentioned, mentioned, you know, kind of thinking about the future, mm -hmm. right? Where, I mean, everything that we've talked about today is kind of talking about survival and uh, health and uh, trying to come out of our current situation as best we can. Um, but how do we think about, you know, with most, most major crises, there are also opportunities. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to get too sidetracked by that discussion because there currently are a lot of now and upfront problems that we need to deal with, but certainly, um, you know, for local manufacturing companies, um, you know, if you're struggling with your current line of business, the government of Canada is looking for help, uh, specifically for, uh, strategic me medical supplies. Arcteryx is uh, headquartered in my writing. They're now making gowns. Um, I think that there is going to be an incredible amount of opportunity around, um, you know, green energy and our, our clean energy initiatives. And if anybody's interested in that, I write all these reports all the time. So I'll just give them a quick shout out. If you go to terrybeachmp.ca, you can read kind of some of these reports on strategies that we've done that up to now. I think there's going to be opportunities to accelerate that. I think there's going to be opportunities in strategic manufacturing, transportation, biotech, fintech. I mean, there's a lot of industries coming out of this where we're going to have to uh, adjust how we do business uh, and potentially uh, think about investing in, you know, what we want the future major uh, providers of net new jobs to be in this country. And that's uh, certainly something that is a conversation that's being had at the federal government. We're soliciting feedback. And if there are ideas, uh, I'd certainly want to hear about it from your from your group. So if that is the last uh, kind of prepared question, yeah. uh, I'd be happy to kind of dialogue and get into the conversation aspect and, and start answering some of those, uh, the, the plethora of questions that you've been receiving over there. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, for sure. We do have a number and I'd like to get to them. So um, the first one that I have here has to do with the CERB. Yeah. And it's one that we've been hearing, and there's a couple of them related to this. We've been hearing this from employers. Uh, so this question is actually coming from Dave at uh, Wayward Distillery. I'm expanding my operations to make hand sanitizer. So he's one of many um, companies that have responded to the call. Uh, also an Island Good member. So thank you for that, Dave. Uh, but because my revenue is caught up to last year, I am ineligible for wage support. But I'm having trouble hiring staff as I'm now competing with the CERB to attract employees. Is this an issue that's on your government's radar? Uh, I would say, I would say yes. Um, I mean, when you look at the foundation of what the federal government is here to, to provide, uh, we've got, uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, two major things, three major things to really think about. We have a foundation of health. I mean, we don't have a solid foundation for an economy if we do not have uh, a strong health care system. Uh, and so that's why everybody's been talking about flatten the curve, focus on that. Um, so that we don't have the same kind of catastrophic um, systemic problems and failures that we've seen in other countries. 
Uh, built on top of that then is how do you take care of your most vulnerable individuals, right? And there are many individuals that uh, fall outside of the definitions of uh, traditional employment. Um, who would have come into some very significant problems uh, if there was not emergency support available. And then beyond that level is, okay, once people have their shelter housing uh, medication available to them, um, you know, how can they provide a future for themselves? And uh, there have been organizations like the one you mentioned. Uh, in my writing, there's uh, Sons of Vancouver who also have switched. They're a distillery that have switched to producing hand sanitizer. Um, we've tried to provide some flexibility around the criteria. I mentioned the baseline earlier about, um, you know, trying to provide some more flexibility with regards to uh, how you measure your revenue. Um, in terms of uh, people being on curb and not necessarily being able and taking those individuals out of the labor force, um, especially in British Columbia, I mean, $2,000, it will get people by and that's why we designed that amount. Um, I don't think that's a number that will necessarily get people ahead. Uh, one of the additional flexibilities that we've made just recently is that even if individuals are collecting that $2,000, they can still earn up to an additional $1,000 and not lose their benefit. Uh, so that might help with that situation, but uh, certainly it's something we're going to have to monitor as these programs roll out and as we get data back on how people are utilizing them. Yeah, and the other benefit, and the other factor in all of that is that the that this benefit is taxable at the end of the year too. Yes, so. it is. It's income. Yeah, it's income. Uh, so the next question has to do with the summer job grant, and, and you may have answered some of this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there still an opportunity for essential service organizations to apply for students? I'm concerned particularly about the agriculture sector and the labor support uh, that they need. There is. It's not as broad as I would personally like. Uh, my advice to you is wherever you're doing business, contact your local member of parliament. Your local member of parliament at this time has uh, a very temporary flexibility for adding some additional organizations to the listing. Uh, and if you want to be that organization, you should contact your MP directly. Okay, the next question you may have answered again, but I'll ask it. How long is the government going to extend these loan programs for? I think that's totally specifically related to the, the business loan program. Yeah. Um, so these are, uh, you know, week by week decisions that will have to be made depending on the situations we find ourselves in. At present, if you look at uh, the business loan program, the $40,000 um, CEBA, uh, Canada Emergency Bank Account, um, that is available now. How long it will be available for? I'm not certain off the top of my head. That might be online. Um, in terms of the payback period, uh, I didn't provide as uh, much information as I could have in my previous response. Um, if you were to borrow the entirety of that $40,000, uh, that loan is interest-free, I believe, until the end of 2021. If you pay it back prior to the end of 2022, you will only have to pay back 75% because 25% is forgivable. Um, after the first two years, if you still need some time to pay back the remainder of that loan, uh, there will be some interest. I'm not sure what the interest rate will be. Um, there will be some interest and you can maintain that loan for an additional three years. So really you can hold that loan for up to five years. Okay. Um, the next question has to do with uh, support from local governments. So how about nonprofits? Uh, what about nonprofits that are getting their annual funding through local governments through annual grants and aid in August. If local government revenue is way down and they have to cancel or reduce the approved grants due to lack of funds, can we retroactively apply at the end of August? Uh, in terms of the flexibility for retroactive uh, applications, I do not have any uh, uh, certain information that I can provide you at this time. Um, it's certainly something, I mean, we have seen some of these programs apply retroactively, uh, including the rental program that I just, uh, we were just previously discussing, which will be retroactive over April. Um, the only advice that I can give you now, and uh, I apologize if it is not sufficient, um, is to, uh, to know that as a either nonprofit or charitable organization, you can either choose to include your previous governmental uh, uh, revenue when you do your qualifying criteria or choose to exclude it, depending on which is better for you. 
Um, just know that once you decide that measurement mechanism, that you'll be locked into that particular method of, of measuring. Um, if that still doesn't allow you to qualify, then and, uh, and you've checked Canada.ca slash COVID-19, and it looks like you're going to be one of these uh, organizations that are falling through the cracks, uh, or you have this exceptional circumstance, uh, there has been signaling that we are willing to make individual exceptions for specific nonprofit charitable organizations on a kind of a case by case basis. But the best thing that you can do if you are one of those organizations is to reach out to uh, your federal representative uh, right away. Okay. Uh, the next question I think has to do more with uh, municipal um, with municipalities. So we have a number of representatives here on the on the call. Um, but how does the, the federal government review the impact to municipalities in the medium term and the reality that some will need to run a deficit this year? Is there federal government support being considered? Yeah, so uh, as a previous Vancouver Island City Councillor, uh, this is uh, right, up my, right up my alley. Um, I, I used to sit on the City Council in, in 99 to 2002 in Nanaimo, and I'm very aware that uh, there are definite restrictions on your ability as a, as a municipality to run a deficit. Um, so I, I can tell you about the conversations that I've had with my mayors. Um, the initial ask from my mayors was to consider allowing municipalities, municipal governments to be funded for a similar program to Q's, uh, therefore, thereby subsidizing their employment costs. Um, the problem that arose there uh, and I take my, the city of Burnaby as a representative example. Um, you know, they have a $200 million payroll. They're down $5 million a month in revenue, not including the savings that they're accruing from not providing some of those services, right? So like when you close down the rec center and the like. Um, so say it's called 5 million a month, 4 million a month or 3 million a month, but a 75% subsidy would, would end up you know, providing a $12.5 million a monthly subsidy. So it's more than they would need, but also it provides some uh, perverse uh, disincentive incentives uh, because they don't have the same pro profit incentive that municipalities have. Um, the concern that I've heard most, so, so that, was kind of, that was kind of a process we worked our way through to say, okay, that wasn't the right thing. Um, and we kind of left that discussion going, hey, let's work with, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, let's work with other municipalities um, because a city like Burnaby doesn't necessarily have the same problems as a, as a program in, in uh, or a municipality uh, on Vancouver Island or in rural Saskatchewan or in the Maritimes, as an example. And most of these programs have to be flexible enough because we have a national hammer. Uh, if we, it works for one small community, it has to work for all, which gives us a pretty blunt instrument to work with. Um, my... Uh, my, uh, we had a, a, a BC Pacific caucus meeting um, last week where we had, um, you know, a number of stakeholders come in and provide feedback across a whole plethora of industries, municipalities, et cetera. And I'm, I'm always in contact with, um, with my own municipalities, but also Metro Vancouver. Um, and and I, I think that there is a, a concern about individuals not being able to make, you know, pay their property taxes as, as one being a, a major source of revenue for municipalities. And, and I inquired about whether or not the federal government could be in a position to backstop um, the paying of property taxes for municipalities, uh, simply because we have the, not only do we have the financial wherewithal to be able to do that, uh, but it's a relatively safe backstop to make. Like people are not gonna walk away from their homes before they pay their property taxes. And even if they were forced to, um, you know, we would still be able to have, you know, kind of a, 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 a liability attached to a, a collateralized asset um, because there was uh, some local mayors and, and councillors talking about the fact that if people, you know, start defaulting on their property tax payments or choose to defer that they, they might not have enough revenue to make critical services. So that was one idea that we were kind of working with. Um, if there are municipal, uh, municipal councillors that are on this line uh, who have ideas uh, that how the federal government could be involved, uh, I am very much looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Well, that's a good invitation. <laughs> um, what about uh, food producers? Most, uh, most food producers focus on uh, food services or export. How can the government help, um, help uh, these producers pivot to local? Is the farm credit program available for PAC financing for fisheries? Yeah, okay. 
complicated questions. Um, I'll, I'll do my best, but it's probably going to be high level and not, not specific enough, but we can drill into it or people can follow up with me afterwards. Um, of course, there's this $287 million rural development fund, which will help a lot of food producers. Um, in terms of uh, domestic food security, I mean, the thing that I'm most knowledgeable about is within the fisheries and oceans portfolio. Um, I believe that there, today's Thursday, yes? That's right, yeah. I believe that there will imminently be uh, an announcement regarding uh, this, answering the specific question about transitioning to how do you transition to a domestic market. So, so I can tell you what the problems are. I can't tell you what the solutions are because uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get in front of my minister's potential announcement. Um, and I don't want to lose my job over this specific question. Uh, but there are specific challenges that we are aware of. Um, if you were a cherry farmer or a uh, fisherman, for example, and your primary market was Europe or China, um, you were probably trying to get your product uh, on a plane and off to that market or in a refrigerated transportation and off to that market as quickly as possible. Um, so we know that there is a shortage of refrigeration capacity, freezing capacity, uh, and transportation capacity for uh, individuals to pivot uh, back towards a uh, domestic market here in Canada, but also potentially to grow their market share in the United States because they might have been servicing these other international markets. Uh, that is a problem that we are aware of and are working on. Um, there are specific programs that are being made for fishers and aquaculture producers. Uh, there are specific programs being made for agricultural producers. Um, I hope that provides some, some information without um, circumventing it. We are working on it, I guess, is what I would say at this time. Yep, so we'll keep an eye on that. Um, so we've got about uh, just a little less than 10 minutes left and we've got a number of other questions and I do wanna uh, allow for some a bit of uh, wrap up time. Uh, the next question, a very specific one, uh, to confirm regarding the um, business uh, loan, uh, to confirm that the $40,000 loan can be, can it be used for repairs for capital expenses? Uh, I, I, want, I believe that it can, but I know for a fact when you take the loan, there is an attestation that you're asked to take, uh, which states specifically what you can utilize the funds for. Um, so I'm going to ask you, and, and that and that particular attestation changes <laughs> depending uh, on. I, I don't know what the most recent items are that qualify for that. Um, so I'm going to ask you to go to the website Canada.ca/COVID19 and check the specific criteria of how you can utilize it. I know you can definitely use it for rent. I know you can definitely use it for operating costs. So perhaps it's a situation. If it doesn't apply to capital, perhaps it's a situation where you're utilizing it for your operating costs and using those savings to move those funds to capital. Um, but I don't want to give advice uh, on that specific situation. So I, I just suggest um, check the website. And if that's not clear, uh, follow up with a member of parliament and then they can go to the specific ministry that is running the program and ask specific uh, questions in your situation. Uh, what I don't want you to do is guess and get hurt later. So, uh, you know, that's a great opportunity, again, to utilize your member of parliament. Okay. Uh, the, the next question is a specific case with the C, CEBA. Yeah. So we had an inquiry. This is from Community Futures, uh, Central Vancouver Island. Oh, uh, hello, Community Futures. I used to work with them. Yeah, that's great. Well, we have an inquiry from a client who has a small business. They went to their local credit union and applied for the program. They were turned down because they were, their payroll was $170 short of the $20,000 payroll. It was 19835 What would your advice be? Uh, yeah, I mean, so I remember when it was 50000 and we were, and people were coming in with their $49,000 payroll, and our advice was lobby your member of parliament, let's see if we get it down. There's a lot of people in the same situation. We did get it down. I mean, in general, I think $20,000 is you basically have a full-time minimum wage employee or thereabouts, and that's what we're talking about in terms of the threshold. The government did have to draw a line somewhere. Um, man, $170 short. I mean, if we're, are we talking about the loan program? 
We're talking about the CEBA. Yeah. yeah. Um, if there's not a way to be creative, uh, I would. I the only advice I can give is to reach out to your member of parliament and see if they can get an exception made uh, by the ministry that's administrating the program. It's the only the only advice I can give. Okay. The next question has to do more with the fiscal picture uh, during the economic recovery. What what uh, what's your sense in terms of the outlook for tax increases to cover the federal funding support efforts during this unprecedented time? Yeah, this is a great question and uh, and one that I'm I'm really excited to get into really because um, you know I, my background is economics and business and uh, you know I, I chose the party that I did uh, and and became a member of the government that I did because you know uh, they're they're despite the name uh, are are generally quite fiscally responsible. Um, all of our criteria up until the pandemic was to basically work to grow the economy, create jobs, invest in the environment, reduce poverty, and try to keep our debt to GDP ratio declining. Um, and we were able to do that. I mean, we created a million new jobs. Poverty was at all time lows before the pandemic, like historic lows, so lower than they've ever been. And we continued to reduce our debt to GDP ratio to low 30 percentile. That debt to GDP ratio uh, was the lowest in the G7, uh, and it is giving us the room to make these investments during these hard times um, so that we don't end up with a similar situation that we did uh, pre-1920s, uh, where uh, we had uh, a horrible economic situation, the government failed to invest, and we had a prolonged Great Depression. Uh, we've learned our lessons since then. Uh, so in terms of how do we return fiscal responsibility uh, to the framework, uh, we are going to utilize the flexibility and, and more than, and, and absolutely with 100% certainty, uh, increase our debt to GDP ratio uh, in the short term in order to fund these programs uh, with a calculation to invest in uh, getting past the pandemic as healthy as possible. That's why you saw a recent announcement for new research for a vaccine or for treatment or for um, uh, you know, surveillance so that we can better track individuals uh, who might have this, uh, this virus so that we can move towards opening the economy back up. Uh, and then I imagine, and I don't want to speculate too much or put our own finance minister into a box, but I imagine that we would be looking to make some further significant investments to uh, stimulate ourselves out of this current situation. And then with a, with a means to return to decreasing the debt to GDP ratio as quickly as possible. And, and if I can take uh, just an extra second um, to tell this audience of entrepreneurs and business people and economically minded individuals, um, it really should be our focus going forward to focus on that debt, debt to GDP ratio. So in the same way that, you know, you can carry more uh, debt and make more investments uh, if you have a higher income, the country can make more investments if we have a higher GDP. Uh, if you focus slowly on balanced budgets and GDP, which is what tends to come up in election cycles, so you'll hear commentators talk a lot about that, um, GDP and balanced budgets, I can balance a budget and make GDP increase in the short term quite easily by selling off assets, mining all the gold, uh, decreasing environmental regulations, pulling all the fish out of the sea. But that doesn't mean that our country will actually be better off or be more wealthy in the long run. Um, so the debt to GDP uh, measurement is uh, not a perfect measurement, but a better measurement than focusing on just those two criteria. And then over the longer term, uh, it's my hope, there's probably a Nobel Prize in economics waiting to be had if somebody can figure this out, is figuring out how governments and countries can have a balance sheet where we would actually record national wealth. Because if we could target our politicians to increase overall national wealth, uh, that's a better thing for us to, to kind of go after. And, and then you can go into measuring, the value of measuring environmental goods like rivers and streams and clean air and clean soil and the like. And if there's a Mount Pauly, for example, uh, you actually have to write that down and explain to your constituents uh, why national wealth took a major hit. Well, because we suffered this major pollution disaster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is a, that is a conversation for a future time, but in the long run, 
certainly that's something that I would like to see not just Canada, but governments of the world work towards. And as we move forward uh, on meeting our 2030 sustainable government goals with the rest of the world and, and return to fight uh, climate change, which is still high up on our agenda to do, uh, those are things that we need to think about. So Terry, we've uh, we've run out of time. We're at the top of the of the hour. Is there any final comments you want to make to our uh, to our audience before we uh, conclude for today? Well, first of all, I can't believe an hour went by that quick. <laughs> uh, I mean, these types of conversations tend to go that way. Um, for all of my friends on Vancouver Island, uh, as a as a previous islander, as I was introduced, I was uh, born in Comox. My mother lives in Victoria. She's a home care worker. My sister lives in Nanaimo. She's a, a nurse at the hospital. Uh, and uh, of course, I went to uh, Vancouver Island University, then Malaspina University College, and was a city councilor there. Uh, you know, I have a very fond affection uh, for the people of Vancouver Island. Uh, I feel like. Um, I get the local economy there. I feel like I get the difference there in terms of culture. Uh, so if, uh, if there are any ways that you think that I can be helpful uh, as uh, you know, a member of parliament, as the BC caucus chair, um, you know, I would encourage you to get a hold of me. Um, obviously my office in terms of constituents who work has to put uh, the priority on our own constituents, uh, but from a broader British Columbia perspective and certainly in, uh, from a, uh, a feedback perspective on programs that you want to see the federal government implement. Uh, at this time, we don't have any government members of parliament on Vancouver Island. Uh, I'm happy to fill that void uh, at this present time, if it's useful for you. Well, yeah, thank you very much. And it's been very helpful to hear directly from you today and for you to take the time to, uh, to ask. We did have a couple more questions, but as we promised, we will pass these on to you. And if uh, our audience has other questions, uh, we ask you to please forward those to our president, George Hansen at george at bahia.ca. So Terry, Terry Beach, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, stay healthy and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, George. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. All right, well, thank you. And a very special thanks to our sponsor today, the Jim Patterson Broadcast Group, who is also a sponsor of our annual summit. We thank you for your sponsorship of today's session. Uh, and like I said, please keep an eye out on our webpage, vaia.ca. You can also sign up for our uh, e-news, and we will let you know what our next session will be. And in fact, that next session will take place on Tuesday, April 28th at 11.30 a.m., when we will welcome back Mike Dells of MNP. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had Mike here to help uh, walk us through the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, and we're going to have him back again because there's more clarity around that, uh, around that subsidy and more specifics about how you can apply and take advantage of that. So please pass that information along and uh, thank you very much. And in the meantime, please keep good company, stay safe. We'll see you next time. Take care.